to. But a while, a little while ago, I heard a story, and it was about a guy named John. And John went to a thrift store, and it was pretty cluttered with all kinds of antiques and things like that. And he was looking for something in particular, just something special that he could use. And he didn't really know what it was, but he knew it was one of those things like he knew it went, he would know it when he saw it. You ever had that? Like, you don't really know what you're looking for, but you know, like, oh man, if I see something that fits, I know, I'll know it when I see it. Well, he wandered around this thrift store for a little bit and he saw something that he thought, you know what, this might be the thing that I need. And it was a bowl. And the bowl was about 18 inches around. I, just a little caveat. I say bowl, and to me, it sounds no different. But, a round thing sounds no different than the thing with the horns. My wife says I say it wrong all the time. So I'm trying to say bowl, like, I don't know, the round thing. And so, um, anyway, bear with me if, if, that's, if you pick that up. I can't hear a difference, but I can see a difference when I read it. Anyway, and so <laughs> he found this 18-inch bowl, and, and, and it looked like whoever had had it before, maybe they used it for just like flowers or for a plant, because it was still dirty with soil. Like, there was soil caked all on this thing. And there were even a few leaves kind of sitting in this bowl. It even had a crack on one of the sides where it really just, you know, wasn't staying together. And the owner of the thrift store, like you could tell, like he hadn't really done much with it or even thought about it because it was almost completely covered up in a corner and there was other stuff on top of it. There were a few books, there were some bottles and just some junk all around it. It was really just a discarded bowl that was super dirty, all that kind of stuff. And so John carefully, he pulls out this bowl and he kind of disguises his excitement because he feels like he's really found something special. But he doesn't want the shop owner to know, you know, because he doesn't, wants to pay the right price. And so he went up front and he bought it. Now John took that bowl home and, and he cleaned it up, worked on cleaning it, and he did so with great care. Because John recognized what apparently the thrift store owner had not, is that the bowl was in fact a fine piece of porcelain. He repaired the crack, even, which was easy enough, and even as important as that, though, he gradually got the dirt in the soil out of its pattern, and he brought out the pattern and what it looked like good as new. Once finished, John put it in a place of honor where it held three beautifully ornate Fabergé-style eggs, showing them off just as John had wanted. Now, last week, we, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The tomb was empty, and He is alive. That's the message we come away from Easter with. And then, so the question on the other side is, like, if the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive, how then should we proceed with living? Today, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1, and we see through the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that you and I are kind of like that bull. Through the, through the price of the blood of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, we have been bought back like a dirty, misused object in a thrift store. And even though all of us have been used for all kinds of purposes, other than the purpose for which God created us, God gracefully, through His Son, Jesus Christ, cleans us, repairs us, and sets us apart for specific purposes not the least of which is to display the beautifully ornate and holy work of His Holy Spirit in us and through His people. And so if that is our purpose and Christ came to restore us to that purpose, how then should we live? Peter has a word for us. Again, we're in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd encourage you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. If you have an app or a device, I encourage you to tap your way to 1 Peter chapter 1. Or if you don't have either of the things, that's okay. We have it on the screen. If you're someone who needs a Bible, see me after church and we can make sure you get one. Um, but here we go. We're going to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we will be starting in the 18th verse. And so here's what Peter writes in verse 18. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose Him as your ransom long before the world began, but now in these last days He has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God, and you have placed your faith and hope in God because He raised Christ from the dead and gave Him great glory. All of that talk about John buying a bull 
runs in parallel with Peter, what Peter is writing here in the Scripture. He says that God has paid a price to ransom us from the thrift store of life. The ransom that was paid with the life of Jesus, and Peter calls it the sinless, spotless blood of the Lamb. Now this idea of a sinless, spotless blood of a Lamb would grab the attention of Peter's Jewish audience. They knew that it was by the blood of the Lamb that rescued their ancestors from death back in Egypt. Thousands of years before that. They knew it was the sacrifice of a perfect, spotless lamb that took away their sins at the temple. And now Peter is saying, is the death of Jesus, it ransomed us from death and took away our sins by the sinless, spotless lamb. Like the bull that was purchased and the bull that was cleaned, the blood of Jesus Christ ransoms and cleanses the dirt from our lives. That's the picture we have here. Now this becomes our hope, that what Peter writes about is true. Because if what Peter talks about isn't true, then really none of it matters. But but our hope is what, what Peter writes is true, that we trust God, that his revealed plan of rescue is that by way of the death of Jesus Christ, we can come into a relationship with him because he will cleanse us and restore us to our created purpose. Now, this is all by the grace of God. We, we know that. And that gives us a way or a path to be rescued from kind of the junk heap, to be cleaned up, to be redeemed. Redeemed, really, for a purpose. Sometimes we get to that. We say, you know what? You need to be saved. And then people say, man, I got saved. Now what? And we say, I don't know. Just kind of sit here until Jesus returns. But no, he says, you have been redeemed, ransomed to partner with Christ to fulfill God's purposes for His people on earth, not just in heaven. And so we begin that on earth and now. Now, back to 1 Peter. We're going to actually jump up to verse number 10. Verse 10, here's what we read from 1 Peter. All right, it's up there. (laughs) This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when He told them in advance about Christ's suffering and His great glory afterward. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is also wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. I think that last verse is really interesting. It says the angels are eagerly watching. I mean, you've got to imagine the the eagles, the eagles too, but the the angels, they have seen a lot of stuff, right? The angels, they've seen a lot go on in the history of the world, but it says they are now eager with anticipation about these things that are happening now because God's plan is is coming into action through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so Peter writes here that the prophets knew that God was going to unleash or he was going to pour out or one of the words that's used in Scripture is lavish. Anybody ever said, anybody ever used that word lavish in like everyday lingo? No, lavish, not really. Not often, at least I haven't heard it, but lavish means just like overdoing it. You know, someone would say, man, they're really overdoing it. Some people, when they eat pancakes, they lavish the syrup on, Right? They're pouring it on, and you just see it go, and it's overflowing the sides, and it's rising on the plate, and it seems like there could be a never enough. Some people lavish ice cream. One of the reasons I love Whitey's ice cream is because you go in there, and you get one scoop, and they give you like two and a half scoops, I swear. They've, They've lavished the ice cream on into the cone, right? Well, God's doing that and so much more. He is lavishing His grace that would rescue people. The prophets knew that God would lavish His grace. He would pour out. He would unleash, if you think of that. You think of the word unleash, right? I think of like, I have a, I have a dog. Her name is Maggie, and she's a, a woodle. Part Wheaton, part poodle. Man, it's not my dog. It's the girl's dog. But anyway, uh, that dog, you know, she goes in the crate, and she cannot, when we come home, she can hear the door close, and she starts making noises because she cannot wait to be unleashed. 
And unleashed she is because you open that door and she's running down the hallway and running to the door and she wants to run out in the yard. That's what I picture. God has unleashed his grace. It's like it's bursting forth, couldn't wait for the door to be opened. And the door is open and through his grace, which the, which the prophets had prophesied about, they have this grace that was unleashed that would take people from where they were and take them as they were. It would take them with their cracks, with their dirt, with their history they had, whatever was in their past. And it was God's grace which would give them a new destiny and a new hope. And so the prophets knew it. They spoke about it. The angels had heard about it. And now they're eager to see this happening. It was kicked off with the ransom that was paid on the cross. It began when the kingdom was revealed all through the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. And so we are an empty tomb people. We are people that live in a new way because the tomb is empty. Because if Christ is still dead, then none of this matters. But we believe He lives. And so what do we say on Easter morning? I, we say, He is risen, and you all say, yes. Let's not forget that. Now we believe that this plan, that this idea of grace, this rescue, it was passed on first through the announcement of the good news. And then it was engaged and activated through the arrival of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, which we're going to celebrate in a couple weeks. The Holy, the Holy Spirit, which sets out to do the work of cleansing us from the inside out, to do the work that works on the damage that sin has caused to the way we think and the way that we live. That's what the good news is. That's part of the good news. That's the action part of it. Now even the angels are watching God's powerful work in the lives of those who follow Him, and they're doing so with great eagerness and anticipation of it being great. We step then into verse number 13, and here's what we read. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. Man, we could preach a whole sermon on that, couldn't we? The God you pray to has no favorites. Remember that. He will judge or reward you according to what you do, so you must live in reverent fear of Him during your time here as temporary residents. Peter says, prepare for action and self-control. Prepare for action and self-control. Those are the things he says to do now that we have received this from God. These things are equipped and empowered at the direction of the Holy Spirit. This isn't doing something just to do something. You ever done that? Like, you didn't really want to do it. It's just you probably knew it was good for you. It's like standing in line at the DMV. Like, you're doing it just to do it because you know you should. This isn't hand slapping for self-control's sake, right? This is someone saying, you know what? I'm going to give up chocolate for the next 30 days. And like they're like, man, I really want some chocolate. Nope, 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 don't do it. You know, so we kind of just do that. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about following Jesus at the direction of Jesus as revealed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so self-control is the transforming of our minds, moving from simply just doing our best so that we get brownie points, or maybe we're just doing something so we don't get caught messing up, to instead not wanting to do those things that God has said are bad for us or lead to death. The things that aren't the, for the purpose that God has given us. God created us with a purpose. Have you ever used something different than the purpose it was designed for? Sometimes blunt objects make great hammers when you don't have a hammer around. I've used uh, screwdrivers as hammers. I've used, my wife's not in here, I've used curling irons for, ha for hammers. I've used things that were never designed for the purpose they were not designed. But, and so what Peter is saying is, is that through God, following the plan of Jesus, that you're doing, you're living in a way for the purpose for which you were created. You were created for a purpose. And so he's saying, don't do those other things. You were never created for those things. You were created for a purpose and it's to live in the way of Jesus Christ. 
Peter describes this as a kind of life as living as God's obedient children. Man, didn't we have obedient children? <laughs> Sometimes we remember the times they didn't obey. Rather, you know, they could obey 24 hour, 23 hours of the day. We, we, a lot of times as parents, we remember that one hour they didn't. But he says, obey like obedient children. Even if, we don't, even if our kids are kind of all over the place, as they learn to obey, we understand that concept. An obedient child of God was revealed to the world on the cross over 2,000 years ago. So if we want to know what an obedient child looks like, it looks like Jesus Christ. Now your children, whether you think that or not, even your grandchildren, believe it or not, this might be a shock, so grab your pearls now, are not perfect. <laughs> I know, that's shocking, right? So they're not Jesus, but they might be close. They're not. But so if we want to see a perfect picture of an obedient child, we see Jesus. If you want to see the next closest thing, you might look at your grandkid. But anyway. <laughs> um, and Peter says, so to live like Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Back to our idea of the bull. Let's say the previous owner of the bull came back to the thrift store to buy back the bull. He said, you know what, I have some new flowers. I need that bull back. And the thrift store owner says to him, you know what, I, I sold it. And so the thrift store owner gives the, the information to, to you, the buyer, or to John, the buyer. And let's say they contact John and say, you know what, I would like to have that bull back. What's your price? Do you think John would just turn it over to be used as something, as whatever, as just flowers to get all dirty and ruined again? No. John would tell the previous owner, that bull is not available. I have ransomed it. I have bought it. I have rescued it, probably, he might even say. I have rescued it and restored it. Because he says, not available. Not only had it been purchased, but it had been cleaned. he had cleaned it. He had cleaned both the inside and the outside of it. He had restored it over time. And he had given it a whole new use for which it, it was really well suited for. In fact, that's what it was created for. It would be demeaning. It would be insulting. It would be ridiculous for this bull to go back to hold just a few flowers or a plant. That bull was set apart for a unique purpose. That bull's beauty had been restored, and that bull became a holder of beauty and wonder. In the same way, Peter says, slipping back into our old ways will be like putting flowers back in the bull. Living in ways that satisfy earthly desires is demeaning, insulting, and ridiculous to the purpose and the price of God. Because not only did God ransom us with His blood, but by the power of God's grace, we are being set apart and made holy for a unique purpose. Having the beauty of our creation restored as we become the holder of beauty and wonder as Jesus Christ lives in us. That's what we were created for. It's by God's Holy Spirit that He lives in us. And to go back to live in any other way for any other purpose would not do it justice. It would cheapen the price that was paid. Oh sure, your, your, your past might come knocking on the door, right? Your past might come around and people will say, well, what about before? Like, you're trying to act all different now, but I, know, I knew you back then. Even you might be tempted in your head to say, is this really me? I feel like maybe how I acted before was me. Maybe you start to believe that, you know what, I belonged and worked out so much better when I was kind of dirty and just kind of cracked and people didn't pay attention to me. But Peter would say, God, in His grace and His mercy, He has ransomed you. He has cleansed you and He has redeemed you for more than what you were living for before. How you lived before, before you knew there was more to life, before you knew that there was this purpose, only makes sense if you didn't know. If nobody ever told you, how would you ever know? Right? I mean, if I had never known there was a hammer and I just kept using the screwdriver at the end of a screwdriver, if I didn't know, somebody would be like, how did you not know that? I don't know. I never had a hammer. But... I know better because I've, I've seen a hammer, right? It's kind of the same thing here. If you had never known, you had an excuse. But now that you know, you know there's a different way to live, a better way to live, a way to live for which you were created. 
And just so we don't think that it's only for a drastically changed afterlife, Peter says in verse 17 that God will judge and reward you according to what you do now. There's a, a school of thought, and, and some people would say, oh, it's a new, way, new school of thought, but there are, no new, there are no new things, just new clothing sometimes. There's a, new, uh, there's a school of thought out there that says, what you do now doesn't really matter because it's all covered by the blood. Peter says, it matters what you do. It matters what you do and what you don't do here. And it can be covered by the blood if you go to Him and repent, but you don't keep doing those things. And so, Peter's reminder here is that how we live and what we do now matters. It has an eternal impact. And even though you don't see the impact right now, it's going to have an impact down the road. So he said, don't live now as if it didn't matter. Don't live as if you didn't know because you do know. Don't live as if it's unimportant because how you live and how you behave matters. That's the story of Christianity. The hard part, though, too, is that a lot of times we try to change that behavior on our own, right? Some people will give a testimony and they'll say, you know what? I've been in church for 20 years and I no longer drink and I no longer smoke and I no longer chew. Okay, I, those are great things. If God helped you through that, then God bless him. But you know, there are people that were never saved by Jesus that no longer drink, no longer smoke, and no longer chew. And, and I'm not saying for some people that would be a great thing, and that's great if they do. But sometimes we're so concerned with what gets cleaned up on the outside, we never pay attention to what God wants to change on the inside. Because he not only wants to change those, those things on the outside, and praise be to God, I don't want to diminish those if that's your story, but that God actually came for to change you from the inside out so that you actually behave differently because you want behave differently, not because you're telling yourself, don't do that anymore. And so you look throughout the Bible, what does it talk about time and again? It talks about envy, anger, jealousy, gossip, <gasps> patience. Yeah, I heard somebody say it, right? The fruits of the Spirit. And sometimes we think, well, that's just like for super Christians. That's not for me. But what Jesus came to do and what the Holy Spirit does in us is change us, transform us. Not just people who kind of clean up the outside, but people that have been cleansed from the inside out. What we do now matters, Peter says. He reminds us of that. How we live now impacts how we live in eternity. At the same time, don't get caught up in the outcomes of now. Don't let your hopes and your destiny in Jesus Christ change because of what you see in front of you. Because some of us will look around and say, the world's getting no better. I don't believe maybe in any of this Jesus stuff. And he's saying, hold on, because there's more to life than what you see around you. Those who have chosen to follow Jesus see life differently. We don't see it as just this short time period where you get as much as you can because it's going to end. Instead, we say there is more to life than even this life. There's a part two to this life. And there's even a way to live this life that brings life rather than brings death. Those who have surrendered to be the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit are resident aliens. Our land, our country, our kingdom, and our king are behind the thin veil of heaven. And one day they will be merged together if we believe Revelation. The here and now will be merged with the there and now, as the new heaven and the new earth become one, according to Revelation chapter 21. And Peter's call is to live as if that were true and it will be a reality someday. So how can you forgive someone who's wronged you? How can you turn the other cheek? How can you not be buried in stressful worry about food and clothes and money? How can you move past desires for instant gratification? You can try, but I believe that God's way is by a thorough changing of your mind that you weren't created to hold just a few flowers, but that you were wonderfully and beautifully made in the image of God to bear His image to others. You weren't created to just accumulate enough food and enough money. That's not your purpose. Your purpose is to be in life with God and to reflect Him to those around you. We were created to be partners with God, first in the Garden of Eden, now in the kingdom of God. 
Jesus has paid the ransom. He has bought us back from the powers of this world. So our hope and trust isn't in the power of a bank account. Some of us are saying, thank God. (laughs) It isn't in the power of a resume to say, man, look at all the great things I've done. It isn't in the power of a military might. It's not in the power of a political party that we like the most. Those powers also don't put us in a state of fear because God is with us. He is with us now in this life, and He will be with us in the next. He defeated all those powers who continually ask us to trust them, and He defeated all those powers that demand that we fear them. And He's saying, you don't have to pay attention to those things. They don't get the say of who you are and what the purpose of your life is. So in light of the empty tomb, we ask the question, how should we live? First, I believe that we come to God and we ask Him to transform our minds and thinking to be in alignment or agreement with His mind and His thinking. You know that you ever had someone like that? Like they just say, they say such good things about that about you that you're like, oh, stop! You're not telling the whole story. I feel like sometimes that's that way with God. He says all these great things about us, and we're saying, I don't believe you. But if we bring our mind and thinking into alignment and agreement with His mind and thinking, I think that's one of those things that can only be done by the Holy Spirit, then we are on the path to following Jesus. First, that He says, you and I are intended for a holy and a special purpose. We're not intended for dirty and deadly uses. Think about that. How would we live differently if we believe that our lives are intended for special and holy purposes. He says, you and I are intended for holy and special purposes. Do we believe Him? Do you believe Him? If the Word of God is true and what He says about you is true, then let's allow Him to bring our life into agreement with how He thinks. We can't keep living in unholy ways and then say at the same time, we were designed for holy purposes. And so he's saying, I'm going to show you a new way to live in the way that you were created. God says that I'm a child of his. I'm made righteous, justified, and holy by surrendering my life to Jesus Christ. Do you believe him? Do you agree with Him? Do you surrender to Him making you so if you're not? That's kind of the paradox. We can't pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and make ourselves any holier. Can we? No. That would be what? Self-righteousness. You ever been around somebody that's (laughs) self-righteous? Maybe you shouldn't answer that question, but... Hopefully they're not sitting by you. <laughs> Self-righteousness is when you make yourself right, you make yourself righteous and say, here's why I'm so good. Being made right by Jesus, by the grace of Jesus, through God, or of God through Jesus, is, is, his, is His righteousness. And so do we believe that we're His child? Do we believe that we're righteous, that we're justified, that we're holy? Because that's what He says about those who have surrendered their lives to Him. He invites me and you to participate in His world-changing activity on earth. This is my purpose and destiny in Christ. Can we say that? I mean, is that a platitude or is that really, do we really believe it? Do we believe that the way we live our life will either partner and participate in what God is doing on earth or work against it? Will I align my life for that purpose? Will I bring my life and attitude into agreement with the empty tomb? The price has been paid. We've been ransomed. But will we surrender our our right to decide to hold dirt? That's what we're that's what we're faced with. Do we want to have our way or are we going to go God's way? Will we allow God to clean us up? Will we allow God to heal the cracks in our lives? Will we allow God to put us in a place of honor to display the wonder and beauty of Jesus Christ? Some people are saying, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't want to be in a place of honor. And that's what qualifies you. 
is that our lives become the stage or the platform for which God does something so great that others can look at it and say, that had to be God. They could have done that on their own. And so what he invites you into is to be a stage or a platform for him doing great things and people being able to see that you've been impacted by the life of Jesus Christ. When you leave here today, voices will be asking you to see them as the defining lens through which you view the world. By that I mean it might be your pain. It might be your past. It might be your emotions. It might be your money. It might be your relationships. It might be your news station. It might be your friends. It might be your training. It might be your culture. It might be a million different things. In fact, it probably is all those things mixed together. They will try to tell you that they are the whole story of what's going on. You turn on the news, what fuels it? Fear. Watch out for these people. Watch out for the Democrats. Watch out for the Republicans. Watch out for the Russians. Watch out for this is the biggest thing of our life is what they'll tell you. But what Jesus is saying is all those things are not unimportant, but they're not as important as the fact that the story of the world is that God has rescued it through his son, Jesus Christ. And whether the political party we like wins or doesn't win, whether the war over here or over there gets works out the way that we think it should, it doesn't change the fact that the tomb is empty. And so we don't sit in a corner huddled in fear for our life because our purpose isn't to survive it. We actually engage with life in the way that Jesus Christ directs it because that is the purpose of life. Not to just survive it. Not to accumulate as much as we can and not to come out with the gold star that we did better than everybody else. But it's that we lived in the purpose for which we were created to display the power of God. These other voices will say, though, that they are their story. And they'll say, you know what? They're the Savior for your situation. But you should live in fear of them. They're not always bad things. Sometimes they're just empty things. They might be part of reality. They might feel like all of reality. But Jesus shows us there is always more than what we see. So don't forget what you've agreed to with God. And don't forget who you are. If you are surrendered to Jesus... You don't have to listen to the resume of your past, right? You don't have to go to God and say, God, I can't be used because this happened in the past. He's saying, this is a new day. This is a new you. And this is where we're going. Will you follow me? Think. People, you have people in your life that are just great like that? Like you start to say, man, I'm so excited about this. And it's like, yeah, but remember you tried this before and it didn't work out. I think they're honestly trying to be helpful, or I hope so. But what they say about whatever happened in the past, the yeah, buts, it doesn't matter. Not in the eyes of Jesus. If you're in agreement with him of who you are, he says you're a child of God, that you're justified, that you're redeemed, that you're holy. And they're saying, hey, I remember when you weren't holy. It doesn't matter what they say. He says, God says you're holy. Even the voice of doubt in your head that says you can't do this. You're pretending to be something you're not. Recognize that voice and hold it captive. Because the thoughts that are saying, did God really say that? We know that the deceiver is the enemy of your soul. And so you don't have to listen to that voice. Now the hard part is that it's easy to remember that when we're sitting in church, isn't it? We talk about God. We sing about God. We pray to God. We doodle about God. Whatever we're doing. But God doesn't clean you up and restore you to your original purpose just for one to two hours on a Sunday. So let's live participating in what God kicked off with the empty tomb. Let's live out the purpose for which we were created by being surrendered to Him in thought and behavior. Don't give up on your identity that He has given you. Don't relinquish your identity to the former things of your old life. You're not who who you once were. You're being made new in Him. And if you're anything like me, it's a long list of things that need fixed. But by the grace of God, 
He makes it better each and every day. We shouldn't cheapen the high price He paid by the behavior we participate in it. Remember that. All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. Instead, we can, by His grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit, live a life that is holy. This is a holiness church. We are a holiness people. We believe that we are being made holy continually by God's Holy Spirit. And each and every day, He draws us by His grace to be more holy. It doesn't mean we're what? It doesn't mean we're holier than thou. It's saying that He, though, is making us holy. I believe this is empty tomb living. And this is living in the way of Jesus Christ. Some of us might look at that bowl and think, well, I don't want to be all ornate like that bowl, but it's just an example. But it's to remind us that God has rescued us and ransomed us for purposes that are special, unique, and holy. But it only can be done in partnership with Him. And so I encourage us to celebrate that, but to also live it by His Holy Spirit. Will you stand with me?